Hello and welcome to Not Another Arsenal Podcast, a.k.a. the Scalacci of Arsenal Podcast. My name is Mike. I'll be your host for tonight. Uh, these wonderful gentlemen are uh, joining me to discuss the Manchester City game and preview a little bit of the Europa League. Uh, go ahead. Introduce yourself, gentlemen. I'm Ryan Koss. You can find me at Gunnar Ryan K at, on Twitter. I'm Christian. You can find me at CLOF31 on Twitter. I'm Kelly. You can find me at South Metro AFC on Twitter. Right on. Everything good with all you guys? Uh, you guys survived the international break. Um, alcohol nope. and uh, alcohol normally helps me through it. Why they had it was beyond me, but <laughs> beyond beyond any of any of us. <laughs> all right. I, uh, I like internationals every now and then. I just don't oh, like. Do you? No, kind not really. I just feel really <laughs> like not really. <laughs> Let's be honest. Right on, right on. The tyranny on. situation almost killed me, so I'm glad uh, glad we all made it through it. Yeah, it was, you know what's oh, funny yeah. is um, it's like me. they kept on asking at that, that right? <clears throat> and he kept on like, I don't know, we don't know yet. I don't know, we don't know yet. Part of me just felt like he already knew he was going to play, but he was just playing the who knows. You know, he wanted to give Pep uh, hope that Galasinac was going to start. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right, gentlemen, let's get into it, man. Um, Manchester City, Arsenal. Uh, starting lineup turned a few heads for uh, many reasons. Um, certain players uh, that people were expecting to see and certain players in positions that we weren't expecting to see. So, uh, Kelly, uh, initial thoughts on the lineup? Well, I think when we see the lineup card, they screw it up so often where people actually play. Every, you, a little bit of it is like, oh, Ava's oh, going to play in the middle. This is great. And then uh, a little bit of the cold water shock of, of kind of how, how tricky we decide to get by playing. And, and we'll talk about this. We talked a little bit about, about it off air, too, um, about uh, William playing a false nine slash ten. Um, what, well, one, again, super happy with the defense. I think that's the best that we can put out right now. Again, I know that Holding has been playing a ton. It sounds like he did his hamstring. He's going to be out for a month. But the wheels were going to fall off eventually. He's played every fucking game so far. But um, Luis was fine. Luis is, I think, is a better player on the on the whole. So I was fine with that. Um, it's a lineup that I just about expected, I guess, except um, Waka not playing. Um, he's played. Maybe his form hasn't been great, but he has been scoring goals. He has been linking up well, and, and usually for big games, he's somebody who features pretty regularly. So it's about what I expected for the lineup. Um, again, not knowing what the the kind of little twist was when the game actually started up right on yeah i noticed that when the uh the announcement came out and they put it on the t- television uh they placed it as a three four three mm-hmm. and and they had like alba was like in a different position it, it looked all janky i wasn't sure what was going on and then when you see them actually start the game it was a four three three uh christian do you think this is the new normal the four three three moving forward or do you think that that is going to kind of be flexible and just depending on the opponent, just fluctuate? I think party will have a lot to say about that. I mean, we played a essentially a four, three, three in possession. We played a back three or a back five out of possession. I think we might see that kind of fluid um, difference between offense and defense against the really big teams like city Liverpool, maybe a few others, but I expect us once party, gets uh, kind of gets into the fold and understands what Arteta is trying to do. I really see party um, helping us switch to a uh, back four, both in and out of possession, which I think will, I, I hope will help us uh, create a few more chances going forward, which is seems to be much of our problem right now. We're, we're pretty good defensively. In fact, we're the uh, second best team defensively in terms of goals conceded, but we are abysmal when it comes to chances created and, um, and goals. So, I hope that party at least solves part of that. I think we still need to bring in an attacking midfielder to kind of complete that puzzle, but um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, for me, for the, the lineup, um, I was glad to see that Saka started. Um, I wasn't sure if uh, Arteta would kind of lean on the main, uh, Ainsley Maitland-Niles uh, kind of left wing back. Um, role because he did that so well in the FA Cup and you know we know how he shuts down opposing wingers um, but I'm glad that even though we played a back three um, 
out of possession that he went with the more offensively minded uh, left midfielder in in uh, in soccer or left wing back in soccer, whatever you want to call him in this in this uh, formation, because I think he offered a lot going forward. I, I think we would have produced basically nothing without Saka on the day. So I was happy to see him. And I, of course, we'll talk about William in a moment, but that was a big surprise, wasn't it? Um, seeing him up top, um, being the, in some ways the, the most forward in a way and in other ways, uh, you know, the kind of the central hub that I think uh, Arteta needed or wanted to hopefully unlock some of our our wingers coming central. So um, yeah, we'll talk about William in a moment, but I was, I was pretty happy with how we set out. I think it's pretty much what we expected with those uh, few exceptions. All right. So talking about William, um, I see it slightly differently than uh, some of you gentlemen. I know um, Ryan was kind of surprised and not very impressed with uh, the role um, Arteta seems to have given him as a false nine. Uh, personally, because of his position, I, I believe he played more as a 10, uh, slightly behind, allowing a little bit more space for Alba and Pepe to get back into the box. But, um, Ryan, you want to expand on that? I know that uh, you uh, initially weren't very happy to see William down that middle. What what I haven't understood was why he's getting the confidence of Arteta through starting all five games when the only good game he had was Fulham with the three assists. Like, I just, I just don't understand with why he has been given the confidence when – you have this $72 million player that you could easily run with. And he's younger, he's faster. I just think he Pepe offers more than William at this point of it, William's career. I think he's more dynamic, but it, it, I keep using this phrase, and I'm pretty sure I stole it from Tim Stillman. But he does what he's told. I, I, think, I think that's a huge thing. Since Arteta is, is wanting to have repeated pat like. He wants to have predictable passages of play. And, and I think he trusts William. And I think that trust supersedes supersedes somebody who's going to be a little bit more dynamic. But I do think, I totally agree with you, Ryan. We're getting to the point now where doing what you're told and sticking to the game plan, if, if we're in a situation where he's not offering enough to push the team forward, especially in a position that is very, very much relied on to individually create chances or Turn shots on goal as our wide boards seem to be doing. I mean, really, who's playing wide ref left and wide right are really doing the bulk of chance creation and shot like creating shots for themselves and for others. If he's not doing that, he, he, at some point, I don't care how closely he keeps to whatever was drawn up on the chalkboard, you, you got to have some results and you got to have some end product there too. So I totally agree with you, Ryan. Like that's it's becoming a problem, but I think why that is is that. He's an old head. They trust him. He's trusted by the coaching staff to implement a game plan. The problem is I don't know if he has the leg or the dynamism at this point to do that, especially in a pack defense with kind of marginal um, opportunity. As aside from Urzel, I think he was the only guy in the squad that could play that central attacking midfielder role, which I believe he was probably playing, whether you call him a false nine or a 10. Maybe it's semantics, maybe it's not. But I think for me personally, I think – We've been so left-sided bias all year. I think Arteta would have known that Pep would have uh, expected it. And I think he wanted to try to get something creative through the middle and deeper to uh, create chances. Because if we're just uh, creating chances through the wings, I mean, we saw what that happened. We, we could basically create nothing from the wings. We, we needed another uh, form of jeopardy, if you will, to get City to think about some different problems. And I think Arteta thought that William could create those. Unfortunately, he didn't. And I think that's what made Arteta look a little bit foolish, maybe even a little bit naive in terms of playing William there in that position, at least against City. But isn't that more damning of William then? Because we basically signed this guy to be a central midfielder, number 10 role, and it looked awful. Isn't And he's on a three-year contract. My, my theory has always been that there's an exit strategy for William, and I don't know why. I don't know why I'm giving <laughs> Arsenal Football Club the benefit of the doubt in this race. <laughs> but, but I like it. I thought, like it. Yeah, Mike. Mike's got to appreciate my positivity here, right? But my thought was always that they have a they have something set up. We're going to have you for two years. You're going to be in MLS. You're going to be in China. You're going to be um, 
with Santi and Abu Dhabi. Like you're going to be somewhere else for the last year of that contract, but it's good for Williams' brand. It's kind of like it's mutually beneficial for the player and for the team to, as this transition point. It's kind of like what Dub Blues has done too, where it's like Luis knows that he's on his he's on his last year at the top flight. If he's going to go somewhere, he's it, it's not going to be at the top six club in the Premier League. And so it's mutually beneficial, even while those guys, this guy's powers are waning here, that you're still going to get paid from us. You're going to help us. These are really good locker room guys. These are really experienced guys. Um, they're people that former, current uh, media people, everybody has really good words to say about their work ethic and all of that. But, uh, yeah, William, I, he is scaring me a little bit. That if, if we're five games in now and it looks like his legs are not going, but are a little bit, heavy and he doesn't maybe have the tactical tightness that he's had in the past. Like that's why you're here. And the, I, if there isn't an exit plan or that exit plan is not cropped up with his performances over the next couple of seasons, like that's going to be an unpleasant hundred K a week, 150 K a week contract a couple of years okay. from now. But I don't want to get bogged down in contracts. Hey, no. I talk about that all the time. We talk about that constantly. We're, well, we're almost at the end of the We're contract not. tunnel, so no. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we cannot do more contracts. We do more yeah. contract stuff in squad building stuff than any other fan base by a mile. So I, I gotta, I gotta put it. In. I'm sorry. All right. Um, all right. So C Christian, just out of curiosity, let's yeah. just assume that William was playing more as a false nine, uh, just for the the sake of this this question. I got two questions for you. Um, Lacazette, do you believe? He deserves to be dropped because I mean, up uh, he had what it was a, he was three for three. He had uh, the miss opportunity. Um, I'm, was it Liverpool? I believe um, still scored that that um, that game. But I'm looking at at this. If you're looking for a false nine, you, you can make an easy argument that Lacazette could have played down the middle and played as a false nine because that's what I believe he he strives at. I think a lot of times people don't pay attention to that strength or that aspect of his game do you think Lacazette would have been better suited to playing as a false nine or do you believe that we should have had Lacazette instead of Pepe as um essentially that second forward uh next to Aubameyang if if William was trying to unlock things as a 10 I I have to give Arteta the benefit of the doubt I think he knows what he's doing and I think um, he was not playing Willian in the same way that he would have played Lacazette mm -hmm. in a similar place on the field. I think Lacazette, for all of his the good things he does, and one of the good things he does for the team that he's probably the best at it is hold up play. Right, he drops deep. He's our target man. Our midfielders or our fullbacks get in the ball. He holds up play and he, and he sprays it out to the to each wing or one or the other, and he does a good job at that. Um, William is not that player. And I don't think Arteta was thinking he was going to be that player. Um, I think what he thought William was going to be is the guy that floats in between uh, the lines, um, in between the center backs and the midfield of uh, Man City. He would get the ball and then he'd be looking for darting runners in front of him, i.e. Pepe and Aubameyang, and would be able to distribute the ball much better than like a Lacazette would be able to do. I think he thought that William would be able to unlock that. Unfortunately, he didn't. So to get to your question, I think it's not a one-for-one -one replacement of Lacazette for William. I think he just was looking for a different skill set out of the player that was going to play in that, in that area of the field. And it just didn't come off, unfortunately. Um, you guys may have also seen that. Uh, a video floating around. I think I might have shared it with you guys of two instances in the game where we were on the counterattack, and it just so happened that Aubameyang, I think in both situations, has the ball on the left wing in the counterattack, and Will and Williams, the farthest forward player, and he makes no decisive run to either side of the center back to get into space for a through ball or an over the top ball for a, a chance on goal. He sort of just straight runs, jogs, um, and doesn't give Aubameyang any pass. And so we end up it, we end up spoiling the counter attack. And I think that was the unfortunate downside of playing William in that position is he just doesn't have that um, that furthest forward player on the counter attack instinct where he is going to be able to exploit space without the ball at his feet. He's not that kind of player. I would have much rather have had William with the ball in that situation and had Aubameyang up top 
and and rely on his movement to get open and have Williams spraying the ball. So I think there was a lot of things that whether or not Arteta was just willing to trade off or didn't anticipate happening that we ended up sacrificing trying to get more creativity in the center of the center of the pitch and it just didn't come off as much as we should have and you know if we were to play this game again I'm guessing that Arteta probably would have looked at William playing either a different role or, or not playing at all and putting Lacazette back in that um kind of false nine position it's the unintended consequence when you do that and, and so it's not and that seems like playing William in the center is not like playing Martinelli there where he's like a wide board but he's very much has those instincts and he has that ability and he's going to totally more lanes Right. Again, assuming he comes back healthy, but William is so not a center. Even like somebody like Pepe, I think Pepe would have made some intelligent. If he was in that position, he would be making intelligent runs. He'd be making center forward type of runs on the counter like that. Um, yeah. But but again, it, it's all trade offs, and, and I trust that Arteta knew there would be some of those trade offs. But it, it's laid so bare in that instance where a normal situation, when not not a striker playing a wide board like a bombing. Game and not a wide forward or inside forward playing striker. It was just, it was two really, really incongruent pieces at that moment where it's like, okay, well, Abba probably shouldn't be here. And, um, and William probably shouldn't be here. And it always looks worse when that happens because especially in a game that's really kind of compact and it's really, um, really kind of a cagey affair. You don't get a lot of that yeah. open space running. And it was just so apparent for all of us, all of us fans like worldwide going, oh, come on. Like, can, they, can we not just, like, flip these guys around right now? What is their dad doing? And it just laid bare in that moment because it's one of the few obvious transitions. And it's like, oh, my God, the guy in the center forward and this guy isn't, <laughs> isn't a creative <laughs> winger. Uh, so I, I totally agree, and I think that's where – I'm sure Arteta, too, looked at the silence and did that. <laughs> That's the ironic thing, though, is that we want William is a player that plays best with the ball at his feet, and Aubameyang is a player that plays best when the ball is coming to him, and he can just get on the end of things and and smash it home. And every chance we had, a lot of the chances we had, I shouldn't say every, but a lot of the chances we had was the inverse, where yeah. where Aubameyang had the ball at his feet, and William was the player that needed to make the run and didn't. So, yeah, it was just that was the frustrating thing about about the day in many respects was that we just didn't have the right players in the right positions doing the right skills that matched where I, they can hurt the opposition. I think Pep is very comfortable with exactly what happened. I think part of the reason why those things have uh -huh. played out that way were also because Pep knows that's a pretty benign situation. That's a pretty blunt attack from Arsenal. If they're going to play William there, they're going to play Ab on the wing. Let Abba carry it. Yep. Let somebody else make damaging runs in behind. So yep. back off, back off is eventually they're going to have to force you it around because there's not going to be the, the incision there. And so that's part of it too. And I think both both coaches are really good with matchups. And it's like, why does this guy keep doing this? But who cares if he keeps, keeps stumbling? Well, because the coach has drilled into his team, hey, we're in, we're in this situation. We're defending this. Give him space. What the hell is he going to do? He's not Without a wall pass, he's not going to – but for all of his incredible talents and his elite skills, he's not going to dribble a guy from the wing and blow past three people from the 10 yards inside the, the center, the attacking half. He's not going to cut to the byline, nutmeg somebody, and then go upper 90. Like, he's just not going to do That's not the kind of player he is. He can, I think, in a smaller field, but in that range, he just doesn't have that. He's not going to be killing the bot Yeah. Okay. yeah. Who is? Which is slightly unfortunate. But yeah, I wish, I wish you'd be going yeah. up. Well, that'd <laughs> so, be great. <laughs> so moving a little further back at the pitch, uh, Ryan, I know that a lot is said about um, the things that went wrong. Um, let's highlight a few things that went right because, I mean, let's – I guess it's important to remember that he, Arteta's not going to get a spot on 100% of the time, and I think this is what between 30 – 40th, 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 40th. Okay, so – uh, highlighting some of the some of the uh, the better parts, um, Saka playing as uh, left wing back, um, sometimes playing as left midfielder when when we were like uh, defending when in a four three three. Uh, what do you think about his performance, man? He seems to Saka, be Saka's our br brightest player right now. I really believe that. I think he and he's so young. That's the best part about it. He's so young, signed a five year contract, and. He looks like a number eight that could be a number 10 that could be 
something for the future, and I really, I'm really happy about it. Yeah, he's a tricky player. You know, something I said to you guys in the group earlier today that um, I don't view Saka as good for his age. Yeah, I think he's, he's just a, good. He's yeah. just a quality player. You know, there's there's some players you could, you know, the age debate is always a thing. You, I mean, look, Pepe, for example, right? They're like, hey, still needs to mature, 22, and that's perfectly understandable. Every player matures differently. But Saka, he's, he's just been fairly brilliant every time he plays and i'm always kind of astonished um granted you could argue that um Arteta's has been a little bit more defensive when he drops him for mainsley but i mean what do you think um kelly do you think that saka's at this point he's earned a spot in the starting 11 i, I think based on merit this year he's one of the first names on the team sheet. he really is and and, and part of what I think makes him such a, I, I think he's going to be an Arteta player. So, so you kind of recall that in managers past, they have these kind of trusted lieutenants that come in there and, and do a lot of things for that coach. And they do it in different positions and different tactical situations. I think what makes Saka not just a good prospect, but a great prospect and one of the very, very best U21 players in the entire world right now is not physicality. He's a, he's a good physical player. He's a good size. He's quick. He's technical. That kid is one of the smartest players that you're ever going to see. He can play left left wing. He can play left wing back. He plays a tactical role, role where he sits inside. He's a good one-on-one -on -one defender. He's a good space defender. The reason why he is going to be a great player and will continue to be a great player, and especially is going to be used well with Arteta, is because he's one of the smartest and most tactically versatile U21 yeah. wide players that you're ever going to find. And he's only getting better. And that's what I love. I love seeing a player that as the physicality, the grind kind of sets in and you kind of, you think of how Deli Alley had a rocket up his ass the first couple of years until they figured him out. Right. They figured him out and they figured out what he could do. And he was too busy. I mean, sucking helium balloons and, and fucking around with chicks out at the club. And again, that's, that's me being a bitter sour grapes and everything. But the point is, is that sock is getting better. He's, he's nailing down. He's getting bigger and stronger. He's getting more technical with more reps. But the thing that makes him great and the thing that is going to – should he should be the number one player on the team sheet for Arteta right now is because you can play him in a bunch of different roles and he plays it at a good to elite level now. And he plays the full 90 and he executes a game plan and he tries stuff too. So in addition to executing that plan, he has the balls – and he has this, and he has the kind of guile, and he has the maturity of thought and, and boldness to try things, to to dribble his man, to take a risk to push up the field, to put in a cross, to try a difficult ball. And he does that from left back, from left wing back, from left eight, and it's from a wide forward position. And that should be, we're all ecstatic for him. And it's not because we're just typing the next guy on. This guy's a special talent. He really is. Yeah, you know, yeah. Christian mentioned that our, our left mm -hmm. side, um, our attack seems to be left left sided, kind of tilted, right? But um, am I wrong, Christian, to to say that when it comes to Tierney, Saka, and Albamiang, there seems to be like a, a understanding that's growing game by game because I, I feel like those three players on the left flank say, they seem very uh, comfortable playing with themselves. I, I noticed that a lot of the the threatening opportunities that we we did had actually were created by uh, by all three of them. Yeah. I, and I think that's by design. I think, um, you know, where Arteta sees us being able to create mismatches and overloads that really can overwhelm the def defenses on that left side because of the brilliance of those three players. And it's not just the individual brilliance. It's the way in which they find each other. They link up, they have an understanding, especially for the further up the field you get, you know, I love what Tierney does in many cases, this game, uh, for the most part, he did this as well as when he sees an avenue and a channel, he really exploits it. He dribbles down that wing and he bypasses the midfield and gets it to Saka or gets it to Aubameyang and worry in the final third, which is often half of our problem on this team is, is getting it from, you know, the thirds to the middle thirds to the final third um, in a productive, succinct way. And so I think there's just this understanding. There's this um, blend of really complementary uh, talents also too that really work. Um, Saka being, I think, the guy that's really pivotal there because, as you know, Kelly really brilliantly said, he's he does so many things really well. 
um, from a good to an elite level. And one of the things that really jumped out at me is just his bravery, his courage on the ball. He doesn't back down from anybody. And I, I don't know if I was, if I was just not paying attention, but I was really astounded by his physicality in this game. You know, Man City, they were really getting physical with a lot of our dribblers and they were pushing people off the ball a lot and, and dispossessing our players. It wasn't happening with Saka. Saka was manning up and playing well beyond his years. And so I think there's that and there's that that ability to stay on the ball and to keep the the drive the the drive down the field alive, which really helps, you know, Aubameyang make those runs and stick with with the game as opposed to give up the run or maybe not make the effort. And so like, Tierney trusts uh Saka to do the best thing with the ball as well. So there's just an understanding, there's a complementary set of roles and and um skill sets there that really work on the left side that don't quite work the same way on the right. If, if Pep Guardiola is rotationally following you deliberately yeah. as part of the tactic, you're doing yeah. something incredibly right. And, yeah. and he identifies, they identified Saka mm-hmm. as, as the danger man. They, they saw about 15, 20 minutes into that game, they go, here's the guy. If we're going to lose, if we're going to give up goals and big chances, this guy is going to be the at the hub, right? And they yep. started just kicking the shit out of him. And you you know could what? argue Rodrigo should have been thrown out for that, too. Oh, yeah. He did and that so many times to Saka. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things where that's – I'm sure they take him back. It's like, no, no, no. It means they're doing something right in this game that they're going in. And every time they see you running, they don't want anything to do with you. They just clip your heel. They let you yep. go by. They kick you. They go through the back of you. They don't, they don't want anything to do with Saka taking that ball and turning up field. Totally. As, fr- as frustrating as, as it is, though, we have to figure out something on the right-hand side. Like Sabio, like Bellerin, Sabios, and William slash Pepe, they they got to create some chemistry. Okay, and so I'm as far ho- as, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry, finish. Your I'm thought. hoping that Party frees up Sabios because I know Sabios is a more creative player than he lets on to be. I know it. I know it's there. It's just a matter of unlocking it and seeing. I'm hoping Party does that because that what Party allows is that defensive midfielder of Sabios to not be there so much and be the creative side that we, we can see and let party take on the defensive side. So I'm hoping that unlocks some of that creativeness on the right hand. It's flank. my concern think, with the right side is that we have a lot of individualist players on the right side. So those are guys that like to dribble. They like the byline dribble. They like to cut in and dribble and, and maybe take a wall pass. There, there's less inner between those three guys. There's more head down guys and, and less interchanging, I think naturally and so i think that's where it gets bogged down a little bit but sorry jump back in there. well i would yeah, i would I add talking about the right flank i was going to ask uh I'll, I'll go to you christian um what do you think about the people that often say that uh pepe just needs a little bit more defensive support on the right flank so a lot of uh, fans have been calling for bellerin to be substituted for uh mainsley down the right do you think that would help pepe and Ceballos get into the game personally the I'm a believer that the key to Sabio's game will be Parte, but for the sake of conversation, what do you think having Mainsley that might potentially be more uh, defensive-minded versus Bellerin um, behind Pepe? Yeah, I, Pepe is maybe the one player that confuses me the most because he's got all the talent in the world with the ball at his feet, but... For whatever reason, it feels like he gets dispossessed way too easily. He doesn't seem to really meld well with uh, Bellerin, even though they overlap quite a bit when the ball is on the right-hand side of the pitch. Um, I think, yes, on defense, Mainsley can add that support in defense. He's a better defender, in my view, than Bellerin is. Um, But he's a much worse offensive player, in my view, uh, Mainsley is, than Bellerin. So uh, I think maybe it, maybe it unlocks Pepe to do more of what Pepe wants to do, which is sort of that take a guy on and beat him on the dribble, but he's not been that successful at it as of late, but he's not going to get that overlap from Ainsley Mitt and Niles as much as, as he's going to get it from Bellerin. So he may not be able to create as much, we won't be able to create as much space for him to do that. Um, pull a guy, pull a center back wide, pull a fullback wide to, you know, follow the fullback making the run. Um, so, you know, until we figure that out, I, I'm afraid that Pepe is going to continue to be on the island that is making him look 
like a guy who either has to beat two guys to get in a position to score um, or just back passes it to, you know, the midfielder who has to swing it around to the other side. That's, that's a problem area we need to figure out. I, I agree with you, Mike, that I think, I think in a lot of ways, Ceballos can't be quite as free to roam as he'd want to be because he's got Jaka as his partner. Once he has party back there, I think that unlocks him to be a bit more creative and further forward, which might help with that. But until we see what party really offers in this uh, setup, it's hard to know for sure. All right. So talking about party, gentlemen, um, as the saying goes, uh, no Thomas, no party. Uh, <laughs> I know, um, I think Ryan lost a little bit of sleep um, not seeing him play. Um, I myself was. He looks tired still. Yeah. He looks tired. <laughs> he has his left in days. So I myself was disappointed um, not seeing him start. I know that a lot of people feel like it was rushed, and I, I take all points um, on board. I just. I, I'm looking at a team with Ruben Diaz that just barely arrived as well. Uh, I don't know how much longer he was with them, with them, but I see him playing. You, you see Chelsea. You see all their all their 28 signings playing um, with no defenders. Um, Ryan, God, God are you are you God bless them? Are you <laughs> at all surprised? What is your opinion? Did you want to see him start? Which I let me rephrase the question because I know that was a yes. Yeah. Um, what was the point of the 10 minute cameo in your opinion? That made no sense to me. It was like, why throw him in there? Like if you're going to throw him in there, throw him when he can make some time. Am I, am I here? Yeah. Okay. I can hear. Okay. So why throw him, why throw him in with 10 minutes to go when there's really nothing left in the game? Like it just made no sense to me. It was a waste of time. If I was party, I'd be like. Why? Why are you doing this? Oh, he's way too humble to ask. Oh, I know, but like, yeah, <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> he wouldn't. I've seen his interview. I don't think. I don't think he would. <laughs> but I, I take he, your he's point. He's just the nicest guy. He seems like he's such a sweet guy for Jesus, the guy who has been like one of the best Simeone players of the last. Yeah, the he's, he's, he's way down period for them. But I mean, I didn't think he off. I don't think he had the chance. He had the chance to really put a staple in the game, which was frustrating. That's what I wanted to see. If you're gonna have all of us wanted us to play with our brand new toy, that's obvious. But like at least give him 20, 25 minutes to get his foot in the game and see what he could do. Not ten. That's okay, like so doing... So one thing that, that came into play, you know, and and look, I don't make I, I'm not I try not to be hypocritical of anybody, but just trying to um, see what I see online, see gather what what fans think, and I just like to express it on the pod and get other people's opinions. Um, this isn't like a hardcore critique on Arteta, but you know you could be critical and you know in a nice way. You don't have to be a see you next Tuesday about it. Um, on that note, um, for anybody that wants to take this question, do you guys feel like it's justified the criticism that he received of maybe not? doing some subs a little bit earlier on in the game that he waited so so late on to bring in not only party but Enketia and uh, Lacazette? I think... So, so party, I totally agree. It's hard to put a deep-lying central midfielder who's going to be a ball progressor in with 10 minutes left and expect him to do anything. Um, I think it was one of those things with more fresh legs. I mean, back in last season, that probably would have been Joe Willock coming in there and doing that. Um, but Joel can't do anything besides run. So I get that a little bit more. I, I really think at this point, and I think the biggest criticism that Arteta had, and I think there's some something there, and I, and I was a, kind of defending this point a little bit too, is I think Arteta was, oh, he didn't want the 1-0 loss, but he was okay with it at that point rather than getting his pants yanked down on the late game in front of everybody and, and having it turn into something that would be 3-0. I think it's important for party to get minutes to get minutes. I think there is something to that. Get them out there, get them blooded in, get them passing to his players because I don't think we're going to have to wait very long for Thomas Party to be started. That's my thing, though. Like, I rather, I honestly rather get, if Arteta, I'd rather have get caught with our pants down. At least we went for it. And instead of going and then standing pat with a one on loss, like, yeah, great. We only conceded once, but I'd rather go for it. And that's what was frustrating. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It was I think it was disappointing fan base wide that we were still pretty passive towards the end and we didn't really push. I get I kind of get why he did it, but I think it's way too early to worry about goal difference. I think that people trust Arteta and the fan base and kind of generally. So you lose 2-0 and push. I, I would have liked to see him push a little bit harder, make the subs a little bit quicker, push people up the field. You don't have to do the arson banger where you bring in three forwards and just play like a two, three, all the forwards, right? But um, I, I would have liked to see changes a little bit earlier. I don't ever want to see Nketiah play anywhere besides center forward again. He can't. He's a, he's a, he's a poaching center forward. He, he reminds me actually of um, Chicharito and his pomp. Like that, that's what he is. So he's not a build up guy. He's not a wide forward. His job is to go in the box and create space and create chances. And so putting him on the right, I hate that so much. Because he's terrible at it. Um, so, so I, I think the biggest single critic, there's two criticisms by, from Arteta's time so far. And I think he's largely been an excellent coach. And I think he's going to be a great coach for us going forward. But I think, he doesn't always get his substitutions right, which I think is probably a reflection of just general inexperience, I think, and, and a lot of team turnover. Um, and I think he, his, his inclination, especially coming from – he played on an Arsenal team that shipped a lot of goals and bled a lot of goals because of naivete. Um, and he came into a team that did very much the same being inherited from Emery because I think his inclination is, is, is always going to be towards more conservative play. And sometimes you're in that spot and those two things come together. And I think they kind of they make him look foolish. But I think it was one of those things where you go, yeah, today he got it wrong. Subs too late, wrong guys in wrong position, not enough to make chances. And we played too conservative for too long. And the subs, the right people did not come in at the right places soon enough. And it, and it kind of led to kind of a damn square end to the game for those reasons. To play devil's advocate, I think there's another consideration that Arteta has to think about, and that is the fact that he's trying to change a culture, a mentality. He's trying to get a whole squad bought into a system of playing and belief in him. And if he goes out there and goes all guns blazing and we get wall at 5-0, um, I think doubt start to get cast into the players' minds, like, can we beat the big teams? Are we? Is this really the guy that can bring us to the mountaintop? And I think... To your point, to use the word you use, Kelly, conservatism, perhaps that conservatism creeps into the way that he's managing this squad still early on in his uh, career at Arsenal and his career as a manager where he doesn't really know. He hasn't had to face adversity yet where maybe he's got some big players doubting him and his approach. And so I think it's him trying to manage that as much as it is any single one game. Yep. And it's super valid for sure. All right, so controversial. Um, I watched the game. Bring it. <laughs> we need some controversy I, on this I, pod. <laughs> me, me, and the me. Um, while it gets said beyond, we'll talk about Christian Lee. If uh, if you want to see two grown men fight over a guy, uh, <laughs> um, so all three of you seem to be of the opinion that he was he was a bit conservative. Um, I, I know that he wasn't all out on tech, but I feel like he was not as bad as some uh, our son leading to believe. Um, I think our defense has, has greatly improved and we had almost the, almost the same. I can't remember um, stats specifically, but we all, we had almost the same exact shots on goal, like clear chances as city did. So it wasn't like we, you know, like years past, we didn't get a shot at goal. I mean, Saka had to himself, Aubameyang had one. Pepe had three headers. I think two hit the target. One went off the mark. So, is it that we're playing possum? We're just you know we're we're okay with having the the rivals keep the ball and then us catch them on a counter or, or slow build up. I mean, we all saw how the first opportunity came with Tierney just kind of surprising. I think it was Cancel and Walker with that work ethic of his and just picking the ball off. I think it went to Aubameyang that uh, passed it to Saka, if I remember that first play well. Um, so, all that said, um, I, I totally take what Christian is saying into consideration. I also thought the same thing when Ryan mentioned it is, I don't think... See, you, you said philosophy, and I just said I think it, it, we, we have a fragile, mentally fragile squad to an extent that, that 
I bet this kind of rebuilding. And I think a Molly Wappen would have put them in a really bad spot. So, um, Ryan, taking that into consideration, taking the chances created, if you, if you think about uh, the chances that, I mean, Saka created one himself, but there's two chances that a lot of people are saying that Saka, Saka and Aubameyang should have buried it. Um, I'm of the belief, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that Edison was immense in both. Um, I don't think him, even, even you could argue the, the Allison and Laka one, I say those two keepers, any other two keepers don't come off their line and close the angle as quickly as they two did. So what do you think, um, Ryan, on that, on that end, focusing on our attack, do you think Saka and Aubameyang should have done better or do you think it was pretty brilliant um, saving as far as Ederson goes? And for whatever it's worth, I actually I got curious and I asked some of the, the fan base a few questions and they actually... Uh, 54%, it was actually pretty even. 54% out of 125 said uh, Edison was pretty spot on. So, um, yeah, I, right? I would say Edison was spot on because I played keeper and it's hard when to come on, when to come off your line and when when not to. It's very hard to judge. And it's it's one of those things that you look great doing if it, pull, if it comes off, but you look like an idiot if it doesn't come off. So Edison just got luck of the draw and he looked like brilliance and it was like coming off like that so i i tipped my cap to the goalkeeper and it was good play by him Saka just unlucky okay ederson ederson is one of the best keepers at being fast up his line in the entire world it's he's up there with neuer he's up there with allison um he he has he has a great sense of I, I would rather have somebody taking a, a shot against Ederson at the top, a step inside the box, and, ch and challenging him to get down or to get up and get to the corner, than I want to have a one-on-one -on -one with Ederson because he, he times his. I, actually, Ryan, I played I played goalkeeper too. I don't play at my old age because I promised my wife I'd stop pulling my shoulders out playing goalie. So, but one of the hard one of the hardest things as a goalkeeper too is having that, and I do think it's an innate sense or a gain sense over time of when to come out and make yourself big. And I think he is absolutely one of the best in the world at doing that. Um, and man, it, you could see Saka's shot, right? It just barely clipped Ederson's shoulder. And so that's not a reaction save. That is just Ederson putting himself and making himself big in the exact spot. Because if he's standing, he comes out a fraction later, that, that curls up for 90 for yeah. Saka. That's exactly the finish he's got to make there. That's where the opening is. But Ederson just got that half a yard closer to cut the angle to get something on that and loop it over. And I just think it, in most goalkeepers in, in the Premier League, you're scoring one of those. It, it is. And, and sometimes you you play against City and they pay $60 million for one of the probably top five to eight best goalkeepers in the entire world. And they, they make a great save. That's it. That, yeah, a, that's where my head is at. Um, Christian, you could A, add to it, or B, uh, feel free to discuss the actual city goal. Um, your choice, sir. I was just going to add that I was a really terrible backup goalkeeper, and I wholeheartedly agree with both of you. So, <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah. No, the city, the city goal, a hmm, couple of things on the city goal. One is... They caught us in the counter. We had Louise running backwards. Uh, I would have liked to have seen him engage the ball a little sooner. You know, I don't think you can pin this on any one player in terms of blame. You've got Bellerin, who rightfully shades, um, was it Foden, uh, to his, uh, to the, to the sideline. Uh, Foden takes it inside, takes a shot at Leno. Leno has a kind of a, a quick save with his hands doesn't quite parry it out of danger and Sterling scores. You know, I think there's, it's a tough goal to blame any one person. on. I think there was a couple of uh, problems that happened further up the pitch that allowed city to get into that position, you know, and frankly city deserved at least one goal from the game. They were, they, they created a few really good chances. Leno had a couple of really good saves coming off his line in particular um, and a couple of other really good shot stops. So they deserved a goal in the game. I think we probably deserved a goal in the game. That's the that's the margins we're dealing with here in, in these sorts of games. Yeah, I think all things considered, if you um, if you take 
into account the games that we played and the games that we lost. Um, I guess we, on paper, we lost the games that we were expecting to lose, but um, on like a feeling standpoint for the fan base is personally, I didn't walk away from both of those games feeling defeated like past seasons. I felt like we were in the game uh, pretty much you could argue all the way to the end. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, rare pickings, sure, but they were there regardless. So, you know, we had an opportunity uh, to to tie the game versus City. We had an opportunity to tie the game versus Liverpool. Um, again, um, I know that people might think that I'm being a little apologetic, but I think we, we – look, man, look at the shit show Adrian did versus uh, Aston Villa. Look, I'm not. I'm not saying, hey, all goalkeepers need to do like, let us do tap ins, but we are facing two of the best keepers in the world. So um, I, I thought um, that both of them did a fantastic job at closing it down. It's so, more, of, it's more of a disappointment for me, though. Like that's how I felt going into those two games. Like I thought we could have gotten a point from both games, and in in. And I think he did get it wrong in some instances. So that's where I'm still left with a little bit of disappointment. But if you told me two of our losses were Liverpool to City and then we still got nine points out of the last five games, I'll I'll take it. Yeah. So, I, Kelly, personally, I look at disappointment as a good thing because if you think about it, let, let's just go one season ago, right? When we, when we were facing, was it City and was it, did we face them? In, yeah, in the semifinal. What was the expectation? Lose. Yeah. We faced them in the league. What was the expectation? Lose. And and on the Liverpool game, not for nothing, I understand that a lot of people are like that that a lot of I'm hearing a lot of people say that that game meant nothing to them. But losing that game meant that they didn't tap out at hundred points. So mm-hmm. I I personally believe it meant something to them. Because I mean, dude, it'd be really crappy in my opinion to just be like, We won, we don't care about anything else. If you're that group of athletes, you want to one up City, right? You're you're in that you're you're up against City. They had you know their centennials, whatnot. They obviously weren't able to go undefeated. I think they did have some sporting uh, initiative to to beat Arsenal that day. So, yeah. um, I view disappointment at these two games um, as a positive. Uh, Kelly, any thoughts on that? I think I think we're building something. Um, I think. Christian said this earlier too. I think that there's when you're re- rebuilding and redoing a culture too that not so recently we got we got to remember that Emery was Emery was here a year ago, like like literally like a year ago. like this time last year Emery was still slogging us through a bunch of horse shit with no particular with losing the dressing room like that that was a thing that happened and, and, <laughs> and the late era Benger too. So I think. Again, I think it's a combination of his, of his natural inclination and everybody's – I would even say I'm sure the players will pay, play a little bit conservative too or kind of hold back or they know or it appears to be a situation that our job first is to stay in these games, to stay in these big games. And that has worked because cup competitions are really important for a lot of different teams, especially when they're not going to win the league and they're out of the Champions League, right? Yeah. They have the FA Cup. They have these cup competitions and – we are winning in those one-off games because we're able to execute a tight game plan, and that's the building block. And, and we have to, again, eventually it needs to expand. And I think that's going to be a combination of uh, developing our own players, bringing in better players, and um, just feeling out this group of players and kind of expanding it out. Losing this game, it was a disappointment to lose it, but there's no shame in losing 1-0 away to to Manchester City there's not and again I know that there's been some goofy ass results but Villa ain't going to be in the top six this is their purple patch during a weird time like again Leicester pumping a punt, bunch of goals they, they'll they they'll lose that game to Sheffield later this year they're going to they're going to go up four to, a, to Palace or something like that I mean that. they gave three to West Ham so yeah about so, Spurs. So, so did Spurs remember that Oh, it's, <laughs> first you expect it. Oh God bless that dude. You you uh, led me into that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really too totally off topic. I turn that game off as soon as Sun throws the one in, and then Kane megs two people. And it's like, God, these fuckers are just gonna let these guys just clump along and do whatever they want. 
and I saw this correlator. It's like, oh no, you you uh, are you are just you are just just the sunshine in my life, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no. I could honestly tell you, I don't watch Spurs game um, other than watch them in the Champions League. I watch them against us. And I actually just so happened to watch the West Ham games because I have a good friend of mine that's from Arizona that recently adopted the sport after many years of pestering on my behalf. Yeah. And, you know, he's like, like well, I, I don't want a top six club, you know, and I don't want to be relegated. And he goes, you know, West Ham seems like a solid team for me. And, and it's been like three, four years. And he's like, he got like, what you know, posters up. He has flags. He went all in. So because of that, when there's like you know it's the London London thing, I'll watch the game, and like me and him were like texting, and he's like absolutely losing it, and then like <laughs> and like first one goes in, I'm like oh there's hope, and he's all like bitch please, I'm like hey a second one, <laughs> third one he just loses his shit man, so it's <laughs> br- brilliant stuff man. All right, uh, moving forward a little bit, we do we are back in European competition, gentlemen. Um, Christian, what do you think as far as the squad goes? Um, not only just the squad, but a, a good point uh, to bring up is we lost another center back in holding. So um, we might see a little bit less rotation in the the back line that we were expecting, which is kind of funny that you, you, you could argue that we were playing a back three because we have like, I don't know, I lost count, like 15 center backs. Um, Unfortunately for uh, yeah. Teta, about 14 of them are injured. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, two questions, man. I mean, how aggressive do you think? Do you think we're going to see a lot of youth? And in your opinion, do you think Partey is actually going to play some some minutes? Uh, good question. Uh, this is – the group stages of the Europa League are a great opportunity for us to showcase some of the emerging youth we have, both emerging youth and some of the youth that have featured in and out of the squad for a couple years now. Um, looking at the squad, I feel like we should see another opportunity for Nelsons, Willicks, those sorts of players to get some game time. Um, they've been sh- largely uh, shuttled off to the U23s this year, so I'd like to see them play some first-team football again just to see what they're learning, see what how, if they're improving, see if they've got anything that's going to make Arteta you know, think twice about their inclusion in maybe more important games during the year. I'd love to see, McG- uh, I think his last, I don't know if his first name, but Aziz, who's on the uh, oh. U23s or U21s, that guy is an absolute baller. And it's maybe too early to see him in the Europa League, but I really hope he gets some chances like uh, what we might see on Thursday because he is perhaps the next generation of uh, central midfielder to come through um, Hale End. And then um, I think we'll probably mix those types of guys, you know, maybe Emil Smith-Rowe, who I'd love to see back in the first team again, see what he's uh, learned uh, at Huddersfield and, and other places in the last couple of years, see what he can provide especially because of his uh, his skill set being in central midfield, um, playing that maybe sort of more right-sided eight. Um, that'd be kind of nice to see him there. I think what uh, Arteta will probably do is mix youth with experience. Um, we're going to have to play experience at the back because I think we only have two healthy center backs anyways right now um, in uh, Gabriel and Luis. So I would expect them to play for as long as they possibly can. And uh, maybe we'll see a Runnerson in goal. Who knows? Uh, give him a, a chance to see what he's made of, see what he's got. I, don't, I've, I know nothing about the player other than what we've all been told by Arsenal. Um, yeah, I, maybe we'll see Party. I hope we see Party. I think he needs to get some minutes in Arteta's system, regardless of who plays around him. I think we just need to get him used to playing uh, his style and with some of his teammates and uh, get him ready for, for competition that matters. Christian, you almost convinced me to watch that game on Thursday. <laughs> I'm watching it, dude. Watch it, bro. Will, it's going to be great. I, yeah, I'm I'm, sorry. Like, I can't get up for these group Farmer League games. Now that I know that, I'm going to specifically just ask you questions about that game <laughs> and the other two games we can talk about Leicester City. Um, I'm actually looking really forward to uh, potentially and hopefully watching Aziz because I, I think that the Europa League has been very bittersweet for us. Um, I, I always make the the argument that when we were in Champions League, fighting for top four 100% of the time, 
and there was so much more pressure of, of starting our strongest lineup in those in those places, those that tournament. Um, we could have potentially, if you think about it, certain of our youngsters could have never got some playing time at the first fields. For all we know, we could have lost Saka, we could have lost Nelson, Willock, et cetera, et cetera. Mainsley, he also came through, right? Um, these are all mm-hmm. players that might have potentially not even got time if, if we weren't in the Europa League. So I'm glad that hopefully they did, we see Aziz. I'm glad that they did, but it's just, it's so hard. It's so hard to get up for Dundalk. Can anyone name a player on Dundalk? <laughs> I'll tell Somebody, you what, I, I have mean, a friend, uh, Owen, you guys on the know podcast. where, where they are? Local team. Ireland? Uh, <laughs> Ireland, yeah. It's actually apparently two blocks away from Owen's house. Um, that. <laughs> He's, he's ecstatic. He said he's uh, thinking about chartering the plane, flying right over the stadium so he can see it since he's not allowed in. <laughs> yeah, so after that, um, Kelly, do you believe whether Party plays or doesn't play, do you think it's going to have an influence on potentially seeing him start versus Leicester City on Sunday? I, If I were guessing, I think he's going to start. I, I think they didn't, they didn't buy it. They didn't pay the release clause on the last day. To bring in a guy who's played dozens of Champions League games, who's been a, a fixture in, in one of the most tactically disciplined, organized, and and um, in the most difficult systems to play in as an interior midfielder in, in, in Europe in the last decade. I think he's a very special player who was brought in for his mentality and his versatility, and he likely is stepping into that locker room knowing and everybody around him is knowing that this is the, one of the very best players at the club right now. And so my opinion, I think he's going to get a substitute appearance at in, in Europe. I think he's not going to start, but I think he's going to come on and play about 30 minutes. And I think he's going to start against Leicester. He's going to be the central midfielder in a four, three, three, or he's going to be um, playing on the left side, partnering Ceballos this weekend. And, I, and mm-hmm. I think right now, because he played two games for Ghana, and he's, he was playing because they didn't. And we got to remember that he wasn't like sitting out athletic. They thought they were going to keep him until we went, knocked on the door and gave him a giant ass check like an hour before the thing. So he was playing the entire time with Atletico. So it's not like he's not, he's match fit. He's ready to go. Um, and he's been, he was playing internationally with Ghana too. So he's been getting 90 minutes in his life. I think there was going to be another longer appearance, a substitute appearance that's going to get a little bit of minutes in his legs, maybe even assuming Danny's going to play or some some of the other first-team players are going to be playing, just get some reps on in the shirt, and, and he's going to be playing, I think, at Leicester. I really do. Cool. Um, God, I hope so. All right. So moving on away slightly from Arsenal specifically, uh, I'm going to just add this to the pod since we have a little bit of time. You guys heard the news of the potential Super League um, might be coming our way. Um, what are you guys' opinions on this? Because I'm hearing different things. You know, they're, they're, I don't want it. You, you don't want it. They're talking about it's like a, t- a 10, 20-year thing. Um, it's going to be, you know, no relegation, which I feel weird about. Now, my question to you guys is, if you guys have any information on it or thoughts, is that um, – is that going to – a, take these teams out of the respective leagues, do you believe? B, is it going to cancel the Champions League? Or C, are they just going to get away, uh, do away with all uh, country cups like the EFL Cup, the FA Cup, you know, Copa Rey in Spain? I, I think at this stage, they're these big teams that are the, the primary generators of, of fan engagement and viewership are trying to get a p- bigger piece of the the marketing pie. So they're doing this as this is a threat. I think this is this is a negotiating piece where they're trying to leverage a larger percentage of TV dollars in different competitions. That's what I think. I don't think I think they would like to do this, but they know that it's not going to be very feasible to do this because a lot of other owners and a lot of other clubs have a lot to lose. If Real Madrid and Barcelona and Atletico are not in there and Arsenal I'm assuming Arsenal, but Arsenal and Liverpool and Manchester United, Manchester City and Chelsea are all out. Right. I think I think they want money and they want influence and they'll always have this carrot to, to extract that from other clubs in their domestic leagues to get more money and to get more influence and voting rights. That's what I think. I think that's exactly right. 
I think that's exactly right because this came on the heels of uh, Project Big Picture, which just got um, annihilated. downvoted, annihilated. And I think these two plans uh, and the fact that Liverpool and Man United were the two clubs that were leading the charge on this, I don't think that's by accident. I think those two things were meant to work together. And whether or not they succeeded was irrelevant. I think there are other aims, which are, of course, uh, financially driven that is designed to uh, line the pockets of those that are bringing in the most money already to, to make them even wealthier. To me, it's quite disgusting how these big clubs have acted because they're not looking out for the West Broms, the people that – the the smaller clubs that are just there to enjoy their football. Like, it it's just a power grab, and it's disgusting in my opinion. Yeah, it's very much um... – a middle finger to the leagues as well because look i know i was listening to the highbury spot today with uh the brilliant uh sophie apps and amanda at the today and uh super kev super kevin campbell uh some mm. of you might know him um he he suggested that potentially you know if these big let's say uh the big six leave england completely right they play in the, in the super league and he suggested that well the championship would just send six teams up and make it, you know, 20 teams. And then, you know, the third goes to the second, so-and-so. So So they'll essentially still have um, a league of 20 teams. And and he mentioned, you know, hey, there are teams in the championship that all have been um, in the first division. Uh, My personal point of view was they're not only just removing teams, but they're they're removing, if if that happened, of course, um, global brands. Right, because Aston Villa, you could you could argue all you want. It, it's historically great team. Leeds historically a winning team, so on and so on. There's there's a lot more teams that I mean, quite frankly, I'm too uh, too young to remember them all. Um, but you take Arsenal, United, Liverpool, all these teams out. I think this the the viewership of those leagues substantially takes a hit, and you don't see the type of the next TV deal renewal will be a half, if not a quarter, of what the league is getting right now without the global brand pushing viewership. I think this is a classic. I think this is a classic case of: Are you English, and did you grow up with the game, and do you want? And this is a part of your childhood. You're growing up. This is a part of your, you know, weekend routine you have with your family, and you want that to stay the same. And I totally get that. Like, if you've got something that you've oriented your entire life around for basically your whole remembered experience um you know to have this game go global and then to have it change the degree that it looks like it might um as much as it's benefited maybe someone's team in terms of the quality of the players that come in you're losing a whole heck of a lot more in terms of your own experience how much it costs to go to a game if you know if this super league actually happens then you know half the games in the year are going to be played you know, where you have to get on a plane and it just gets so cost um, prohibitive that it, it it screens a lot of those fans from even being able to participate like they're used to. So you've got that English side and you've got the global fan who, you know, doesn't care about all that. You know, in theory, it's people like us who live in the States who, you know, are saying well, we just want Arsenal to make as much money as they can because we want them to get the best players as they can and play the best teams in Europe as they can. I'm saying that's a theoretical argument. I'm not saying that that's necessarily any one of our singular arguments, but that's the case that a lot of people might make because they don't have that childhood attachment, that local attachment that a lot of people in England might. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that American owners are leading this. I, yep. I, think, I think I think there's no, and this is, I'm largely regurgitating, but uh, uh, Elliot, Yankee Gunner, and um, some of those guys talked about on the Arsenal Vision Pod, I think last week. Um, the idea of this with no relegation guaranteed contract this is like creating a, a american domestic league with the very mm-hmm. best again we, we always declare that the winners of american sports competitions like football the world champions yeah it's what we do um we're this bastards is way, it's, it's what we do we, we invade and invade and americanize things it's 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 kind of caught i hate using this it's so charged but it's like we're colonizing <laughs> with football right um, but I totally understand that, and that's and again, that's American fans 
or American ownership doesn't see a, a historical or a traditional benefit to engaging in this pyramid. And it's like, why the fuck are we propping up these guys where the, they, they come to see us, they come to see um, Sergio Aguero, they come to see, uh, I mean, here and work Aubameyang, they come to see Timo Werner. That's who people are here to see. And the idea that we're kind of prop that we're there to do that. And it's even not even the parody that you see in like major league baseball either. There, there's no, it's too long of a season. And it's too complex of a sport to not have the players with the, the team with the best coach and the best players, which often are bought by a lot of money. Those are the people that win in this sport. And, and so it's not surprising. It's, it's, it's self-interest and, it's finding the game in teams, especially lower down the pyramid, but even lower down the Premier League, in a financially compromised state. And, and billionaires usually get where they are by having a keen eye for weakness and exploiting that weakness, especially financially when it rears its head. And I don't think it's I don't think it's coincidence that's happening now. And a lot of these a lot of these teams are hurting, and a lot of these teams are soft, and a lot of these teams are kind of there for the picking. So if they want to deserve that influence, that bottomless financial resource. I don't think it good. happens, though. I, I, I really hope not. I, I, would, I, I, would, I don't think it does. I, would, I, I think eventually they're leading towards my, my hope, which again is like the gross soap, is that they're using this to just push the sticks a little bit further. And pushing yeah. those things further, it better advantages them competitively and financially, the big six. And again, it's weird for us, right, because we don't want to see this. And, and, and I got a hard time thinking that the Cronkies aren't uh, aren't uh, on mute yeah. on this conference call, saying like, hey, like, mm-hmm. but we lost Thomas Vardy, <laughs> like, can we come play too? Like, we're good. Yeah, yeah. To your point about viewership, did you guys see the, it was reported that, you guys know that it's like fourteen ninety nine a game for yeah, folks in England, pay-per-view, yeah. It was reported that the Burnley West Brom game this past weekend had 72 viewers pay the 15, 14 99, 72. Oh, no. So, yeah. I mean, That's you talk one. about, you talk about viewership and, and what, what clubs bring money in from a TV revenue perspective, you know, the Burnleys and the West Broms aren't it. It's, it's, it's the Liverpools. It's, it's the big clubs well, that we're talking I about. I don't, I don't know if, I don't even know if Liverpool would have drawn much more. Like in England, half of, more than half or not are probably illegal streaming it anyway. Yeah. Because of because the whole viewership there is totally different. You have to pay for Sky yeah. Sports. You have to pay for BT Sport. You have to pay for so many different subscriptions that for us it's really easy. We just pay for basic cable and get NBCSN, or you pay NBC Gold or whatever to get your games. So it's really easy for us to view games. For them, it's very hard. Isn't that ironic? I, am I the only I one? Honestly, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say Peacock. <laughs> I, no, I, I pay for them all too. Yeah, no, oh that, because uh, otherwise we'll miss out on games, right? But I'm you know, a... um, to be completely <laughs> to be completely honest, because I think that sooner rather than later, later, and, and you've seen the the prices increase, right? Because like you like different leagues, right? I watch City, yeah, so I here's a fiber a month for ESPN Plus, you know. People that la- like La Liga, they have to sign up for Beans Plus. So they mm-hmm. already started with the, hey, Ronaldo fans, you want the Liga? You're going to have to give us five bucks over here. Hey, English fans, guess what? You're not going to be able to see in Arsenal all the time on NBC. So you're going to have to give us five bucks over here. I think sooner or later, these prices in America, they might be more readily available to us. But I, I think sooner or later, they're going to spike as well. Because I, I think one thing sporting sporting teams do very well um and it's very unfortunate but it's exploit passion and exploit Mm -hmm. fans love the game so you know um i would never never illegally stream nor would i ever condone anybody to do so i'm just saying (laughs) some people will so it's a double-edged blade and maybe you should ease up on your fans because right now what they're doing to uh, like not only English, you know, we don't know what's going on in other countries. It's kind of some baby back bullshit because you know damn well that that, that game is, mm-hmm. is embroidered in their, in their whole tradition over there. And the fact that you put that behind a paywall on top of already paying a monthly fee, it's, yeah. it's a very shitty thing to do. I so. mean – some of the UK podcasts I was listening to were saying that they pay 180 quid 
to get their football. That's unreal. That's insane. I pay $190 just to get my cable and internet, and I get more channels than they do, it feels like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely more readily available to us. And I, and well, I think for us, because we're a market that – we're, we're a market that's becoming more tapped. It was largely untapped until I, I even think that streaming became more prevalent. So they were able to provide us more games than the kind of one game a week or one game per time slot. And and they, they see us as such a cap talent. So it's working. I'm sitting here in my Adidas kit because I watched that awesome video last year and I went out and bought one for whatever amount of money. Yeah. There's the, there's the banana. There's the awesome marble one. You, you saw the David Seaman with the coat. Yeah. Like that, right? <laughs> like so, so we're, we're people who want to be passionate and, and we we find a team that we love and we find a lot of value in the team not only in the in the current product and, and maybe even more so in the product that existed in history that was here before we got here right and and they saw that and and give it give us a taste give it to us for cheap and, and we're going to get addicted and we're going to start spending a lot of our money and time and energy doing it that's and, a great point because NBCSN was free at one before yeah. mm-hmm. it was free and everything every match was free for like the first year first two years. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's 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 finding it's finding that audience and it's it's finding a lot of it's finding a way to access us. It's taking the it's taking the tour, the priests and tours in the United States and. It, it's going to come down the pipe, Mike. I totally agree. It's it's going to find its way over here. It's going to get that far because they have embedded fan base. They have people like us that have now been Arsenal fans for a decade or, or, or almost or more. And and we can speak intelligently about the invincibles that happened before we were paying attention. We can love Ian Wright, who we never saw play. We can talk about Herbert Chapman. Like, like we can do all this shit because – this club means something to us now. And it's kind of a cool thing as American fans who didn't have access until very recently that we can page back through the histories of our club and find more things to love about it and more things to get us engaged, yeah. more things to make us passionate about that we didn't know before, we didn't experience before. And we're suckers. We're in prone position. I watch Arsenal Football Club more than I watch any of the NFL teams or MLB teams. Or I come from a market totally. that has a big professional baseball that is – I have a – Again, bad teams, I guess, but I have majors what would be considered the U.S. major sports. And if an Arsenal game's on, I don't care about those other teams at all. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's Same. how we got here. And, and, they, and they they kind of farmed us that way. But I'm here, and I'm not let. I mean, I, I'm not yeah. changing now. If, if they tell me that I got to pay ten bucks a game for Arsenal, I'm not going to feel good about it. But I'm probably going to do it. Right? Hmm. Yeah. Well said. All right, gentlemen. Uh, Ryan, you want to start off with your failware and let the people know where they can find you on Twitter? Yep, you can find me at GunnarRyanK, my hashtag right there on Twitter. You can find me with all my bad takes and more at CLOF31 on Twitter. I can find all my uh, semi-insane ramblings at <laughs> South Metro AFC. <laughs> all right, I'm going to try not to screw up the outro this time. My name is Mike. You can find me... At Mike Hers FC on Twitter. You could find the podcast on NA Gooner Podcast on Twitter. You could find us on YouTube on Not Another Arsenal Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and share. Until next week, gentlemen. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Peace, guys. Later, guys. <laughs>